I shall lose none that the Father has given me. And Paul elaborates on that. For the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God. The gospel is the good news. And so when I see in a reformed community online right now today are holding secondary issues as primary issues, and, and it's like, it's heartbreaking. If anything, a right understanding of God's sovereignty should be the most humbling <laughs> of all the things. Grace and peace, grace and peace, everybody. Back at it again with another live. Um, and this this time, I know it's not my usual Fridays or Saturdays. Um, this time, um, we're doing a uh, do a little uh, switch today, uh, just on Tuesday, um, because we got a special guest today, um, the other Paul, and his link. I have his link to the channel in the description below. You guys should definitely check out his channel. He has great debates uh, on his channel. He has. Uh, Different, just, just different topics he, he, he tackles on. I have definitely been edified through his channel. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Anglicanism and the history of Anglicanism and obviously talking about the many things within that. And so, yeah, the other poll, why, why don't you uh, just uh, introduce yourself to everybody? Mate, thank you very much for having me on. Yep. So channel name, the other poll, actual name, Paul, of course, um, and actually named after the apostle. So not some other random figure named Paul. <laughs> and I am a Sydney-based Australian Anglican. I make I have made this channel specifically for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ, but not not just that generically, but to put specificity on it, um, f f uh, to bring academic academic tier and levels of content and an appreciation for actual primary source historical and theological reading, but for laymen to understand and to help them get on that for themselves so they're not just reliant on oh well this scholar says this this scholar says that right. but that layman can actually get an appreciation for these issues themselves um all ultimately for a to guarantee a complete and accurate understanding of what god has revealed to men mm. amen amen yeah and no, i definitely uh i have definitely loved your videos you put out and guys, he uh, he actually has a video coming up. I'm gonna kind of uh, promote you here. Here, um, he, you have a video titled uh, "Reformed Anglican versus an Anglo Catholic." Kind of, they're having not more, more of a debate. Would you call it more discussion? Would you call mm. it? So yeah, it's pretty much a. It occupies a nice middle road between a discussion and debate. Um, so the, the the as you you've already seen it, but the first part happened like one or two years ago. Now it's kind of crazy, mm. actually. Um, and that one, it was supposed to be a, it was supposed to be one whole thing in itself, but I didn't anticipate how much discussion, how much debate they're going to have on it. Um, and so they only, they only covered two out of like seven topics I had lined up and that wow. was on, um, oh, it was on a, it was on a couple actually. It was on the sac, it was on the sacraments. Yep. Actually, it might have just been on the sac. I'm not sure. It was on the sacraments and I think one other thing. I'm not, uh, I'm not clergy, sure. I know they were talking about clergy, like, um, a little bit there. Like, you know, if, like the clergy and like how, how, how would one start a church within Anglicanism and stuff like that? I don't, th I don't, I don't know if it was that, but, but either way, we covered <laughs> two out of like seven yeah. topics total. And so for a long time, there's been a plan to have a part two to cover everything else where I'll more, I'll more yeah. carefully guide the time. So it gets done in right. time. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's basically what's going to happen. And there's going to be a lot more in this one, including the one topic um, where these two ministers actually uh match in my facebook comments online and we're basically at each other's necks over it <laughs> so and that, and that issue is the deutero canon so they'll be discussing mm -hmm. and debating that as well that's going to be very fun and, and when's the uh, part two going to be uh what date part two is happening well in australian time it's going to be happening on the 27th of this month so probably your 26th probably probably yes yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we uh, people who don't know, it's it definitely me, me and other Paul have been exchanging, you know, text messages via Facebook and getting the time right. It's not easy. <laughs> One, it's not easy just me trying to get another Christian YouTuber who's within the United States to, like, schedule something. But so imagine doing it from across the whole world <laughs> in Australia. <laughs> Honest, honestly, like, there's, a, there's, a, there's so many different apps you can do that, but I'll, I'll probably just get either for my uh desktop browser or just on the desktop itself just some permanent app that just has all the clocks for different time zones so i just don't yep. have to go to worldtimebuddy.com or what have you for everything right yeah yeah and no, I, I definitely just uh like on my phone on the i have an iphone so i go on the clock app and it tells me you can you can search up whatever country you want and it tells you the time um 
But uh, uh, before we get started, uh, kind of let's uh, say hello to people who are watching. Um, we have the other Luther, um, yeah. evening gentlemen, and then we have um, Jonathan Sunbaker. Uh, amen, brother. And we have Tommy D Studio. Tommy, one of my <laughs> mates, local, local actually. So there you go. <laughs> yep, there you go. And we have uh, other said Australians always messing up, <laughs> always messing. No, nah, that's sorry, that's your guys' fault for departing from the true apostolic time zone of Australian <laughs> Eastern time. <laughs> is he in a different time zone? Is that what it is? That's that's it. He's um, he's uh, well, Tommy's a local with me here in Sydney, so uh, okay. that's uh, that's us. All right. All right, so let's let's dive in then. Um, so I got I got my questions here posted up. Um, so Paul, what, what why don't what would you say like what is you know Anglicanism and what what does it mean to be in, in Anglicanism or in an Anglican? I like to define Anglicanism. I think the best and most essential definition of Anglicanism is to consider it as Reformed Catholicity in those kinds of words. So you have, and its its whole purpose is to chew on the meat, spit out the bones, and don't, it, with respect to any area of doctrine, of ecclesiology and what have you, don't overemphasize this part to the expense and destruction of another part. It's to try and maintain the whole purpose of Anglicanism and what I believe defines it is that which maintains the full continuity of the true faith and accepts correction where it needs to happen. So the best example of that, of course, would actually be with the Reformation era Church of England itself, posterior to the split of Henry VIII, who, by the way, he to dispel, dispel that myth out of the way, um, he was a, even after his split, he was a card-carrying Romanist, okay? In all this doctrine, he even wrote, well, before his split, but he even wrote a work against Martin Luther, and he was titled mm -hmm. a defender of the faith by Rome. Um, and so even when he split with Rome, he didn't change his doctrine. He wasn't like, hmm, the Protestants are right. I'm going to split from Rome. That's not what happened. He split from Rome, um, basically in a way, in a, in a way kind of reclaiming the old ancient order where in effect, the, the Roman, the Christian Roman emperors were in effect, like ruling over the church. He basically just brought it to that, but for England, but mm -hmm. ultimately for the purpose of getting an annulment, um, because, and, and it wasn't just because, oh, look, I'm, my name's Horny Henry. I want another wife. No, it's, <laughs> it was actually for very serious geopolitical reasons that whether he's doing so legitimately or sinfully, that's another question. Um, mm -hmm. the point being, Reformation Church of England Anglicanism comes after that with Thomas Cranmer, um, who is in Europe actually to help out Henry VIII in that endeavor. But he learns of the Reformation as that's happening and he thinks, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So he basically ships the Reformation back to the Church of England and it takes over quite quickly, actually. Although you have a brief season with Queen Mary, aka Bloody Mary, <laughs> who, uh, who yep. brings it back to Romanism, a lot of well, as her name suggests, a lot of bloodshed there. But after her, it comes back and Reformation Anglicanism takes hold. For, really for the full story there, um, one, one of the participants in the first part of that interview, Reverend David Old, also a local Australian Anglican minister here, here in Sydney, actually. Um, I had another interview with him before. I believe I, it was called The Trajectory of Australian Anglicanism. And he basically gives that whole history in greater detail at the beginning of that uh, stream. So I highly recommend people to go to him uh, go to that for greater detail. And also uh, this book over here, which I've only just started getting back on, but basically from what I've been told is the definitive history of the English Reformation, a book by Peter Marshall called Heretics and Believers, A History of the English Reformation. And so uh, I've been told it's, it's more or less a complete definitive account of this. And so I, I guess I'd also push people to this. Um, ultimately, of course, that uh, you can chase up the primary sources and read them for yourselves, not just uh, rely on whatever a scholar says. But in any event, um, that's that's more or less how the Church of England, well, the Church of England preceded the Reformation, of course. Right. Um, but uh, the Ang Anglicanism as a distinct theological movement began after, not with, but after the split um, from communion with Rome. So, and that wasn't the creation of a new church either, because that's actually something very common in the early church of people, of local churches breaking communion with one another, including right. with Rome. That didn't constitute a new church, ipso facto. So it was the existing structure of the Church of England, broke off from Rome, new theological movement of reformed Catholicity, where they preserved that which was good and wholesome according to the scriptures and according to the universal practice of the whole church, um, not just at any one particular time, but from beginning to present, um, but also rejected the errors of the current church. That's, that's the key additional factor of Anglicanism. It will accept what's good and wholesome, 
Um, it'll cling to the authority of Holy Scripture uh, as supreme above all. Mm -hmm. um, also, however, to the testimony of the church um, and will only ever depart from the current practice and belief of the present church if it is clearly demonstrable that such goes against the universal belief of the church prior, but especially of Holy Scripture. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the difference here. Maintaining Catholicity of doctrine, but with the self-recognition of fallibility and the ability to reform. And mm -hmm. that's, that's why the historic Anglicans would argue that we're the real Catholics in that we are act actually trying to maintain continuity um, with the entirety of the history of the church and of ultimately of the scriptures and not just assuming that our hierarchy is always going to get everything right and damning everybody else who doesn't agree with him. Okay. And that kind of go, goes into my next question. Are, are Anglicans reformed and, you know, obviously Protestant? And I, before you answer that, I kind of want what you, what you think about this. I heard a quote on, on YouTube. I'm, I'm probably going to paraphrase it. It said, uh, someone said, Anglicanism at its best is what Rome would have looked like if it would have conceded to the Reformation. Possibly, yeah. But actually, yeah, probably, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, um, it's a very multi. Well, here's the tricky part: the Reformation, very multifaceted battle. It wasn't just over one thing. There were a right. whole list of issues, and even mm -hmm. they and they weren't even all equal issues either. It was like you'd have one big issue, and then you have multiple sub issues under that as well. Um, I'm fully studied. I haven't fully studied the Reformation, and when I say fully studied, by the way, I mean to the most ridiculous levels of depth that I can, because that's what I consider to be fully read on something. Right. Um, but from what I do know, I mean, yeah, yeah probably. It probably looks something like historic Anglicanism. Okay. And would you say like Anglicans are Reformed or or Protestant, would you say, Anglicanism? Properly speaking, yes. Um, again, obviously not to this, not to necessarily to the extent of, say, the, the Puritans or... The Presbyterians or continental reformed or what have you, they have other distinctives um, with which we Anglicans disagree with them on. Mm -hmm. uh, chief among them, of course, being things like the regulative principle, um, right. which is wider than just the regulative principle of worship, although that's part of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, that's a major thing in which we in which we disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and so, I mean, yeah, pretty 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 much that. I think. I'm so sorry. I think the question just somehow slipped out of my mind. Again. No, you're good. You're good. I was just like, are are, Ang are Anglicans reformed? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so, and if you've seen my channel, you know I don't like the term Protestant. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but um, in the in the charitable sense, of course, of the Magisterial Reformation of those original those original movements that came up. Well, yes, in this in the sense that the, the Anglican tradition, as we know it was actually it didn't it wasn't just influenced by the reformation it was a definitional part of the reformation mm -hmm. um and so i i would argue and, and there's probably many anglo anglo catholics out there maybe they see this they, they probably disagree with me a number of them um right. but i believe of course they're wrong and so i believe that it is definitional as an anglican to be reformational in mindset um and in like terms affirming the five solas and for the, yeah, the five solely kind of kind of generally, although even then it can get a bit kind of complicated and like, well, what, what do we mean by the five solely and all that? There right, are some right. distinctions in there. Um, and it's not just those either. It can be it can be a bit wider than that. Um, I think the overemphasis on the specific term of solo scriptura, not the principle, the principle is great and absolutely true, but the mm -hmm. overemphasis of that term as what we believe. Um, that's done a lot of damage because obviously you'll, you'll, you'll get a lot of Roman and Eastern apologists online. They'll say, oh, you guys believe in sola scriptura. Oh, but where's where's that in the Bible? Where's the canon in the Bible? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's not only misleading because, well, because the arguments suck, but right. it's also misleading because sola scriptura was not the, it's a real principle that, reforma that the Reformation and Reformation Anglicans hold, mm -hmm. but it's not the whole structure. It's like saying that Roman Catholic authority is just ex cathedra statements by the Pope. I mean, yes, that's the highest formal authority, mm -hmm. I guess you can say, in the Roman Catholic system, but it's nowhere near the only kind. There's there's numerous other modes of authority in the Roman Catholic system. Likewise, with the Reformation, which affirmed the authority of the universal testimony of the church. And it wasn't that wasn't just an Anglican thing. Right. That was basically perhaps less so the reform. They were they were a bit more critical with the right. use of the testimony of the church but to my knowledge i don't think any of them actually denied that 
the universal testimony of the church from the beginning to the present mm. could basically settle an issue. The, the Lutherans explicitly affirm that as well. You can say that with Martin Chemnitz in his examination of the Council of Trent, he explicitly affirms that um, that the Lutheran tradition a- accepts the universal testimony of the church and further that if there is an opinion of scripture brought about, which has no precedent in the ancient church, it just can't be true, period. So it acts as guardrails in that respect as well. Um, right. So in, in light of all that, long, that's a long way to say that, yes, I believe definitionally um, Anglicanism involves reformational thought in terms of authority, in terms of salvation as well, um, but not necessarily with every single particular of different traditions and figures within the Reformation. Yeah, because um, obviously you have differences with the Reformed and the Lutherans, for example. Right. Yeah, and even even me as a Reformed Baptist, I, I've heard even other Reformed Baptists say, like, yeah, if, if you're the first one to think of something when you're reading the Bible and you go through the church and the church history and it's never been taught or thought of, <laughs> you're probably wrong. <laughs> you probably, probably stick with the church on that. <laughs> precisely. So, yeah, precisely. Yeah, and so, right, and, and so like even Solo Scriptura doesn't, uh, I, I think we can all agree, um, what the East and the Rome think, we, we they think we might mean solo scriptura, but we, that's not what sola scriptura uh, is saying, um, because we, we're not saying it, it, scripture is the only authority, but yeah, it, is, it right. is the authority that all other authorities um, um, are, are are under. And so, but yeah, so it, and it's the only infallible authority. Um, yes. But um, but yeah, no, uh, so let me go to the next question then, because I think um. I think you actually even touched on that a little bit. Um, so our Anglicans naturally have a high view of liturgy and the sacraments. Yes. Yes. Um, that base, that's basically quite definitional. Now, excuse me. We, I guess at this point, unfo- unfortunately at this point, we have to distinguish between the Anglican tradition as a, as an intellectual whole versus Anglicanism as it exists today. Unfortunately, um, Excuse me. Um, unfortunately, many, many Anglicans, including where I am in Australia and, and particularly Sydney, Australia, um, even if they're very socially conservative and what have you, which is great, fantastic, and they affirm basic orthodoxy, again, great, fantastic. Unfortunately, there is a wide, wide movement of heavy evangelicalism uh, within the Anglican church today. Um, and I say unfortunately because, well, one, I believe it's 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 a wrong-headed emphasis. And, and by evangelicalism, I do mean a de-emphasis of the sacraments and over, um, it, it, like an emphasis of the word and the reading and the preaching of the word, but to the unnecessary expense of emphasis on the sacraments, as well as a sacrifice of proper historical reverent lit- and religious really Anglican liturgical worship. And in its place, putting in more contemporary forms because of frankly, false presuppositions that contemporary right. equals it's going to attract the unbeliever which is just a that's that's just that's just not how you do church period or or, or another presupposition of where like all oh, these fancy vestments and what have you god doesn't care about that we just need worship to be kind of simple which is in- interesting because then why do you have all these instruments and uh, sometimes right. smoke machines even and what have you but <laughs> yeah. and, and that's that's a false presupposition too because yes obviously god god is not is not propitiated by having vestments and and fancy liturgies and all that obviously mm-hmm. But right. God does rejoice in that. Um, that, that. That's a whole other topic. So, I mean, in any event, right. that's very common. To, that's very common today. Whereas historic Anglicanism has always upheld in 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 our formularies, in our most authoritative writers, that the sacraments are absolutely essential to mm-hmm. have a high emphasis on, and that good form and prop, good and proper form of worship is necessary. And, and this this is one area, really, arguably the key area of dispute um, with the with the with the Puritans and other Reformed camps, where we don't accept the regulative principle of worship, where um, for where every all elements of our worship must be directly found within Holy Scripture, either explicitly or by good and necessary consequence. We we don't we don't grant that. We, we our principle is more so that. As long as something is not repugnant to scripture, it is permissible. Um, and if it's and if it has been something that's good and positive and beneficial, and it's and, and again it's not repugnant to scripture, then it is actually sinful for uh, someone to go and openly oppose that and try to get rid of it. Um, right. And so, in 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 the context of our liturgy, that's how that's the case. So, we'll traditional Anglican liturgies will have high church looking type things like altars, priests with vestments 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I haven't studied the history of incense use, so I can't say that for certain. Although I would not be shocked at all if incense was indeed uh, burned in historic Anglican liturgy. Um, but also with our Book of Common Prayer, uh, which actually I've got one right here, really good common version, uh, mm -hmm. the International Edition by yep. IVP Press. Very, very I good. Have, I have that one. Yep. It's great. It, it's very good and useful. Um, it's the main mm -hmm. one I use. But uh, that that is meant to go, that was designed to go along with with something mm -hmm. basically of a high of a high liturgy quote unquote not in the sense of rome of course but right high liturgy in that it's very reverent there's uh mm -hmm. a lot of symbology at play in the imagery it's and, and that, that's the key emphasis of traditional liturgical thought whether mm -hmm. it's an anglicanism or or lutheranism or rome or the east yeah it's where it's basically upholding the idea of honoring the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength and that mm -hmm. we're worshiping him with um uh what's the what's the word on all cylinders basically mm -hmm. so it's not just a platonic thing we're not just singing words and we're thinking we're thinking nice thoughts of that are pleasing to the holy spirit mm -hmm. but that we express this worship in all ways because we are visual and audio or in audio based beings as well um where that's how we express our worship and that's how we can come to understand uh the divine as well and so in light of that liturgy is meant to engage really virtually all the senses uh and that's the that's how anglicanism has historically happened and uh unfortunately a lot of that's been lost today but to answer the question yes it is uh comparatively to today to protestantism and evangelicalism today mm -hmm. anglicanism is very high church right and and even me as a reformed baptist uh i i can i, I can i can say i can i can appreciate what my anglican brothers and sisters their liturgy and I, 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 me and my wife have definitely benefited from the prayer book, um, you know, and so like that, that that's uh, definitely something where even me, like I said, like just a Reformed Baptist, I can definitely appreciate the liturgy, even though me, myself and my tradition as a Reformed Baptist might not have the same liturgical form as 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 one is Anglicans do. But and would you say everybody is liturgical in some sense? <laughs> Sorry? Would you say everyone is liturgical in some sense? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, that's and that's that's the myth of and, and and obviously there's many evangelicals out there who they're just kind of born into it, so they haven't thought about it. And they're not like anti liturgy necessarily, mm -hmm. but there are a great number who either at least know of liturgical types of worship or have grown up in that and actively come to oppose it. And and I think that is one major mistake where they where they think that um well well, well yeah they actually they, they deny that all worship in some sense is liturgical. We are engaging the senses in some kind of way that we think is reverent and glorifying to God. Um, and so to think that just stripping things back to be simple or whatever is just, it's silly. Virtually no one does it. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of the problem. So right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And yeah, definitely. Uh, and so would you say even in, especially within, within Anglicanism, prayer is liturgical within Anglicanism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that's why you will have it's not it's you won't just have well okay again in, in modern anglican context it, it very often happens the case and, I, and i'm not i'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing as well i'm just just to state the difference right um you will often have prayers that are well pre-written and, and we call them collects um other traditions like rome do as well but we particularly like to use that term um so you'll have these prayers that are pre-written and there's a number of them for many different occasions. Again, if you've if you've looked in this one, which you have, there's mm -hmm. numerous collects at the back for many right. different situations, in including in the liturgical calendar, like the collect of the day, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, kinds of pre-written prayers that they're written they're written according to a similar formula. So if you read all these different collects, you can notice that there's there's kind of a consistent pattern and structure to all of them. Um, and so in that sense, even our prayers are indeed liturgical because. We, we don't just do them as something that's just, ex again, difference in worldviews between us and evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. It's not just it's not just platonic. It's not just authentic in the sense of it comes from the spur of the moment, from what we feel the Holy Spirit is moving us towards. Mm -hmm. Again, not that that idea is a bad thing necessarily, but the idea that the Holy right. Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit equals extemporaneous and what you feel, that that's that's right. just a completely false uh, false equivalence, uh, mm -hmm. false uh, equivocation. Mm -hmm. Um. Whereas with us, we will treat prayer, we'll 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 structure prayers carefully so that they are that they are the richest in what they are requesting of God, and they say the most about Him, about His goodness, about His glory, um, and about what we need. And that's why our, our prayers are 
fundamentally quite liturgical as well because of that structure, which allows for right. carefully planning our prayers and putting in what we need in them. And, that, and that's why I myself, for example, um, at my parish, there's a regular roster for the person to do the, the public prayers at the up the front. Um, often people, often it depends on who it is. Sometimes some people who are called to do that in a week will do it with something that's pre-written, although not in the same structure and wording as like a traditional Anglican prayer. Some of them will do it kind of extemporaneously with just some dot points. I myself mm-hmm. deliberately write my prayers, uh, my public prayers at my parish, pretty much like an Anglican collect um, out of out of the hope, both because I believe it's it, it puts the most richness into my prayer to which people can say amen, but also so that it exposes the wider parish who are pretty much all like more reformed, more evangelical, mm-hmm. exposes them to that kind of, uh, to that element of Anglicanism, at least right. I hope. So, so yeah. Okay. And so we, 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 we've been mentioning this book of the common prayer. And so for anybody watching or anybody watching on the replay and those who don't know, can you explain what is the book of common prayer and kind of its history? Yes. So the book of common prayer is essentially the central liturgical, well, book of the Anglican tradition in its history. It had a few stages starting actually earlier in the 16th century with Thomas Cranmer and a few other major figures. Um, but it eventually re- received basically something of the most definitive form in 1662. Um, and that's the most common edition used today as, as the edition that is essentially accepted as a, as one of the formularies, which is basically our fancy term for authoritative documents in the Anglican tradition. And so that, that, that shows another great element of Anglicanism. Sorry, I just got to open my window quickly. It's getting hot in here. Mm-hmm. Um, that's another great thing about the Anglican tradition where, uh, which is something that's somewhat similar in, in certain respects to the other church where our, our liturgical documents, they're not just things that we sing and pray and then just put them away. Our liturgical documents, because they reflect our belief um, from, from the principle lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of faith sometimes with the additional lex vivendi, the law of life or the law of living. Right. Um, because of that, we therefore take our formularies to also be an authentic expression of our doctrine and therefore a doctrinal authority in our tradition. Uh, and so that, and that arguably sets us quite a bit apart from uh, the reform for the most part. And also I, th- I think the Lutherans as well, because I'm not, because they, they'll take the book of Concord as the collective of all their uh, of all their authoritative documents, I'm not I'm not aware of any liturgical documents in there. I, I could be wrong, um, but in any event, that's a significant thing for us. And of course, the Book of Common Prayer, it's just so in, so fantastically constructed that almost every single tradition has has pretty much derived their own prayer books from it. In many ways, you can you can find um, like in the in the Roman tradition, for example, that there, there is at least one kind of prayer book from that. In fairness, it is for Anglicans who largely for Anglicans who convert to Rome, but still they have that. They have a, a kind of mm-hmm. adapted BCP. Um, I know a number of Easterners, Eastern Orthodox, who have who adapt the BCP to their own use. Um, you 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 own one, Reformed Baptist, and I know there's mm-hmm. a bunch of others who do the same as well. Mm-hmm. Methodists, especially, of course, they 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 adopted from that. I think even mm-hmm. um Charles, uh, I think I think it was John Wesley, or was it Charles? I think it was John Wesley himself who basically said the BC the 1662 BCP is the greatest. Mm-hmm. liturgical document ever composed yep. um which is the one thing he's right about <laughs> but, <laughs> yep. sorry, sorry, to, yep. sorry my methodist friends <laughs> i've heard actually the first time i heard the book of common prayer was from a presbyterian uh, recommending it there you uh, go yeah there you go yeah that's uh, that's how beautiful it is and and, and to, to hype it up to basically talk about the basic structure and it has numerous things for, for pretty much the whole of our liturgical life it'll have a, uh, a morning prayer has an evening prayer has the procedure for Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. Um, it has a commonition, which is very, uh, which is very based. Uh, it has an entire the entire liturgical calendar in, in it. So, what readings to do, um, what feast days to observe, mm-hmm. what prayers to pray on what day, as well as uh, as well as lists of other prayers you can pray. And the of course the international edition here has a bunch of extra ones you can also mm-hmm. uh, pray. Um, it's, it's pretty much a complete package of Christian liturgical life. And the great thing, the fantastic thing is that the morning and evening prayers, um, a, they're just, they're, they're beautiful. They're not super long, but they're very rich and they're densely packed. And it's pretty much just a consistently woven tapestry of Holy scripture, but just in a Mm. new form, which is what's ultimate selling point of the book of common prayer. And 
what's great as well is that these prayers can be done any in any context, whether it's just you on your own with a group of friends or even in the regular Sunday gathering at your mm-hmm. parish. Um, right. now, now, of course, ideally, you'd also be taking the Lord's Supper, which involves extra elements, but that's in, in, in the BCP as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's basically what it is. It is, in, in terms of our worship of God, the BCP is the central ordering, um, organizing principle of the Anglican tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And what, what I noticed too, like where it's heavily, like pe- people, when you read the Book of Common Prayer and you do the morning or evening prayers, and me, myself, like me and my wife, we, uh, sometimes we'll do the evening prayers because I get up so early for work and I, I just rush until I can, me, I can only, you know, if I want to do the evening prayers, I, I can do it. So we do the evening prayers and you're, you're just saturated in scripture. You're, you're like, you know, Absolutely. and then you're directed to the Psalms. In fact, the, the one you, when you just pulled up the copy, you pulled up, in fact, that's the same one I have, it actually has the whole of Psalms. Um, in it within it yeah yes that's right um, that's that's what i forgot to mention as well yeah the psalms yep and <clears> and so like even when you're reading the prayers and you're like i said you and my wife do it together and like you 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 just feel like that conviction in your heart as you're reading the prayers to god you know and so um but yeah th- that's one thing we, we definitely uh have appreciated me and my wife have appreciated and i i recommend it i have recommended it it to other people, uh, other Protestants of other traditions. Um, and so what, what would you say, what can um, other Protestants, particularly like the historical Protestants, like, you know, Presbyterians, Baptists, uh, even Methodists and Lutherans can learn from Anglicanism and like those watching, what would you want them like to leave with? Oh man. So uh, <laughs> become Anglican. Um, <laughs> pretty much. Hey, if I'm being straight up and honest, that, that's that. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's something I'm emphasizing a lot on my channel. Obviously though, in the end, um, uh, if assuming that doesn't happen mm-hmm. yet, I'd tell them to take away for one, just get it, get a BCP yourself. I mean, as far as, as far as I'm aware, well, okay, again, historically reformed. I mean, wars were fought about maintaining the BCP in the Church of England. So, you know, reform mm-hmm. might be a little bit salty about that. Um, but otherwise, uh, other people like Lutherans, I know, I know Lutherans who, who use the BCP, um, mm-hmm. even if they don't agree necessarily with everything in it. Like one of the key ones, of course, being with the Lord's Supper, Lutherans have a very particular view, which mm-hmm. arguably the BC, which arguably the BCP contradicts it in the part on the Lord's Supper. But I, I actually kind of argue, and I think some other people agree, it actually might not, it might just be talking in different terms. But in any event, since you're not an Anglican, you can just kind of overlook that, I guess. And the BCP is still an absolutely fantastic um, way to structure your church life. You don't have to, you don't have to go to some some online like um, five five steps to improve your prayer life. You won't believe number three or um, some kind <laughs> of random random course by Pastor right. So and So and what have you. You have a document that was quite literally produced by the combined effort of the church and the state, like the church at the state sponsorship in England at the, mm-hmm. basically at the height of the church at that time, um, produced by men who are absolutely seeped in, uh, in Holy scripture, in the mm-hmm. history of the church, in debates around those issues. Um, and so with all that knowledge, they, they poured all that knowledge and all that wisdom right into this document, the BCP, um, which has become foundational for the prayer life of countless millions of Christians a- a- across the world. And that, and that could probably very easily exceed over 100 million plus if we include non-Anglicans who, who use it, arguably, as mm-hmm. not to mention uh, offshoots of the BCP. Mm-hmm. Um, and so get yourself a BCP. It's a ready-made um, complete package of your liturgical life that you can just pick up get it happening and i have on my channel actually a guide for how to how to use the bcp particularly how to pray the morning and evening prayer that's with um with the other guy in the discussions that i've mm-hmm. hosted uh, that i'm hosting uh, uh father father james uh father james or barely protestant as his channel's called right. so you can go to that if you want to know how to use it it's actually very simple once you get the hang of it and yeah do that but also reflect on the principles of the anglican tradition which i think all of the reformation traditions can and should actually agree on of reformed catholicity where we Mm -hmm. are part of a pre-existing church that goes back to christ we're not a restorationist movement Mm -hmm. um where all everything that came before us after the apostles is fake it's not a true church it's completely false and we're bringing back the church that christ established no 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 even Mm -hmm. even if we believe that great heresy at some point spread throughout even the whole church uh at some point 
it's still nonetheless God's people who he wants to call out of apostasy. It's still a church Mm -hmm. um, as long as the God, even in Rome, as the reformers would say, as long as the gospel is preached there and the sacraments are administered there, they're still a true church, um, Mm -hmm. even if there is apostasy in its official beliefs. And so we want to pull them out of it. And so in light of that, reflect on those principles of maintaining continuity with the Holy Scriptures um, and with the testimony of the church insofar as it coheres with the testimony of Holy Scripture, Mm. um, but also have that mind for reformation. Don't just take whatever your current church authorities say, um, no matter how high, even if it seems at one point all the pastors across the world and all the bishops and what have you across the world come to say, yeah, we believe this newfangled thing. You don't take that for granted. The principle, the principle of the Reformation, and actually quite demonstrably, the principle of the ancient fathers and the principles of Scripture themselves. Scripture itself is that you test all spirits. You test all the spirits um, mm-hmm. according to the Word of God. Uh, and so, even if there's something Amen. that appears to have taken over the whole church at some point in your time, you are to st- you are not to just take what they say for granted as if they are the voice of God. No, we have the Word of God here. Mm-hmm. Everything else subsequent to that is is uh, inferior to that. Mm-hmm. And so if we are called, if, if, <clears throat> if we are at a time where it seems the whole church is against the script uh, is against God, then as Paul himself says, I am against the world. Mm-hmm. So that's what you're supposed to do. It is the both. It is the maintaining of the tension. And it, uh, admittedly, it can be a tension of mm-hmm. the both. And we both maintain our continuity and our adherence to the universal church insofar as it's faithful to scripture. And yet we can acknowledge when the church goes awry and I need to reform it. Mm-hmm. So that's so. Those are the key things that I recommend for non-Anglicans: get a BCP and maintain the principles of the Reformation, as I, I argue are best expressed in the Anglican tradition. Mm-hmm. Amen. And guys, who, who, whoever's watching too, like I, I have um, spoken personally to uh, uh, an, an Anglican, an Anglican, uh, uh, a good, a good brother in the Lord, and he, he has. Um, he has definitely uh, helped me um, how to use the Book of Common Prayer and just the history of it too. Like, like he, he even said, like the Book of Common Prayer is heavily reformed. And obviously, me reading it for myself, I can see that you can see it clear as day. Like you see, you can tell. Like definitely, the people who have brought about because it, it was obviously more than one person who brought about the Book of Common Prayer. So you can t- definitely tell. Like they were obviously seriously conducting like, this document. Like you said, it's a document. Uh, putting together all these prayers and with, with heavily uh, involved with scripture. Um, so definitely uh, people, you guys can look up um, there's tons of videos of how to, how to do the book of common prayer um, out there. Um, and so like Paul, wh- what would you say that um, how, what do you see Anglicanism in the future? How do you see that? Well, that's a wild card, honestly. Um, it depends on what our leaders want it to look like frankly because so right now there is there is if you i don't know if you keep up with anglican church, church politics much but there is a time right now simultaneous simultaneously of great danger but also of great opportunity mm-hmm. so earlier like uh, towards the beginning of last year of course the church of england ratified um the permission of blessing same-sex unions not not marriages um, they like Rome <laughs> have ever made the distinction. Oh, it's not, we don't call it marriage. So technically it's something different, which is complete bull, but whatever. Yeah. All that being said, they've, they permitted that and pretty much straight away, um, the, the, the wider Anglican communion, like 85% of it as represented in the, uh, GAFCON movement, the global Anglican futures conference, as well as the global South, which is basically non-Western, uh, portions of the Anglican communion, 85% of the whole thing in total. So, so functionally the communion um, mm-hmm. rose up with the exception of a few little apostate sects like the Episcopal church, the church of Wales, and I think a couple others, they rose up and said, yeah, we don't recognize your leadership anymore. Goodbye. See you later. And that was formalized <clears throat> at the GAFCON four conference last year mm-hmm. at, Kigal- at Kigali in uh, Rwanda, um, which was fantastic to see. And so what that showed is that, our communion by and large is very lively and very active in maintaining orthodoxy and, and further wanting to spread that orthodoxy because in, of course, in response to that, they've now been, there's now been great investment and movements towards basically 
basically stealing parishes and people and leaders from the Church of England mm. by the wider by the wider communion. There'll be parallel jurisdictions that have been set up to basically do that. That that exact thing happened actually earlier here in Australia um, after okay. our own general synod, which didn't affirm same sex unions, but it failed to pass a uh, a statement by my own archbishop actually here in Sydney, Kanishka Ruffel. And he and it failed to pass it, even though it, it passed with a great majority in the House of Laymen, in the House of Clergy, but only just failed in the House of Bishops by like one or two votes. Um, and so because of that, a number of dioceses here in Australia took that um, as an affirmation of their freedom to have same-sex unions. In response to that, GAFCON here in Australia, which basically represented the Orthodox diocese here, came together and established uh, something called the Diocese of the Southern Cross, which is basically a pan-Australia diocese where any parishes that want to come out from under the yoke of apostate bishops, they mm -hmm. can do that and come under the authority of the Diocese of the Southern Cross. And, and a number have already done that. And the effects we're seeing is that I've, I've, heard, I've heard of at least multiple um, church closures and, and, and parish mergers in those apostate dioceses because of that, which, which is fantastic. So... What that says for our future is that we are very proactive in responding to heresy. But one of the great, massive dangers right now, and I mean huge, is one, to a lesser extent, the neglect of the Anglican tradition, where we come to tolerate much more um, evangelical, low church type conceptions of worship in the church and what have you. I think that's, that's arguably the root of the next thing I'm going to say, which is the more direct danger. And the more direct danger is the problem of women's ordination. Mm -hmm. That is mass. That is a huge problem right now, even within the so-called conservative dioceses that fervently, even, even fervently oppose same-sex marriage and what have you, a number of them will ordain women to the priesthood and even sometimes even to the bishopric. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. that's a massive problem. Wow. Um, because yeah. whatever side of that debate you lean on, you you that those are those just completely opposed ecclesiologies, and they're not just opposed ecclesiologies for how to run the church but they are also necessarily rooted in completely opposed anthropologies. How, right. just, what is man? What has God ordained for mankind, for the different sexes? How do we right. treat the different sexes? Mm -hmm. in, 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 in just the most basic senses of practicality, forget, forget whether someone's a heretic if they affirm women's ordination or not. In terms of practical Christian life, you cannot have them together. It just mm -hmm. can't work. And, and, and of course, it goes back to hermeneutics as well. Mm -hmm. People who oppose women's ordination um, assuming they don't just jettison scripture deliberately and they claim to be uh, faithful to scripture, they have a completely different and completely erroneous hermeneutical method compared to those of, of us who oppose women's ordination. Right. <clears throat> so it, it's, it's a totalizing, it's a totalizing effect that just can't be done mm -hmm. and that it can't be tolerated. And, and li in light of, of course, what Anglicanism has historically upheld, not to mention mm -hmm pretty much the whole church since the beginning, as well as the clear testimony of Holy Scripture, we right. cannot tolerate women's ordination because women's ordination is a backdoor snake, as history has proven, mm -hmm. to many evils and heresies. Not the only one. Um, of, of course, it, complicated factors can be quite complicated. Um, but nonetheless, it is a snake in that it, it, quite den it denies the clear word of God by use of all sorts of hermeneutical loop-de-loops, which mm -hmm. allows you to do the same for basically every other issue. Right. Um, and so if we can't resolve that, then we may as well pack up our bags as Anglicans because we're just going to become the Episcopal Church in a few more decades. So mm. <clears throat> what happens with Anglicanism is going to heavily depend on whether we actually, to, to be blunt, grow a pair, stop, mm. stop appeasing the liberals, which even many conservatives in our denominations, not just in Anglicanism, but everywhere, um, we, we feel like we have to be the nice ones and we can't get the liberals angry. But the liberals, they're free to get angry and, and right. I, was say, I was about to say a bad word there, at basically everyone and anyone for their things. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't feel a compulsion to tell them to shut up, basically. Mm -hmm. But now, thankfully, um, by God's grace, that is becoming more common now, especially since Father Calvin Robinson. I don't know if you heard of that whole debacle. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. The whole thing where he gave his speech to women's ordination. He had some cringe comments about the Reformation, but and there's a good article, by the way, our friend River Devereux, he actually made a good article in response to oh, that yep. in the North American Anglican. But yep. putting that to the side, his comments about women's ordination, fantastic, spot on. And he gave it he, he, he gave it the necessary um, severity and bite that it deserves. We need to stop talking about this issue. Again, conservatives need to stop being little uh, little kids. Right. I mean, not just little kids, but, but basically the... 
the emasculated husband who just does whatever his nagging wife demands that he does. Mm. We need to stop doing that. You need to put the pants put the pants on, be the man in the house, mm. and tell these borderline heretics, if not outright heretics, to shut up mm. uh, and 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 actually take ecclesial power to do so. And we need to, we need to stop act, acting as if we need to be nice about this. Yeah. Um, we need to be completely blunt about our wordings better, about just how serious a danger it is. Amen. Thankfully, that is becoming more common. Um, but again, whether it's a success is going to depend on whether it it becomes a feature for the right people in the right places, particularly our hierarchs, whether they be bishops, archbishops, or primates. As if, if that attitude of zeal, of like fiery zeal for maintaining the truth of Holy Scripture um, as well as the good of the tradition, insofar as it coheres the Holy Scripture, if that can spread once again through a hierarchy across the world, then we can beat that back. But again, it's a game of whether that will happen. Right. Yeah, definitely. And and definitely before I became reformed, you know, Calvin, Calvinists and all that, that was one thing because I, I grew up egalitarian and uh, obviously. You know, the Lord grabbed a hold of me and, you know, I started taking my walk seriously with in, with the Lord. And, you know, that was a, like literally one of the first things uh, uh, I, I noticed right as soon as I started reading the word uh, more seriously uh, is, uh, hey, uh, why, why do we have women elders and pastors? <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and ever since then, I became a, a card carrying complementarian, you know, um, all the way through. And so, and obviously there's a, obviously a new movement, uh, biblical patriarchy uh, coming out now. And obviously, you know, there, there's some good things there. And obviously, you know, there's some obviously concerning things, which I mean, and anything, anything that's always going to be an extreme to all, all sides of everything. Um, anyway, but yes, definitely uh, within, even not, like you said, not just Anglicanism, other traditions as well. Um, that is like basically the doorway to uh, other heresies uh, is women's ordination. Um, you know, it's, I think it's plain, plain and clear. Um, and so before, um, we get to some, uh, questions, uh, in, in the chat for anybody who wants real quick, uh, I want to kind of ask you, are there, um, reformed AKA Calvinist Anglicans within Anglicanism, especially even in the history of Anglicanism? Oh yeah, of course. I'm one <laughs> because, um, because Calvinism, and that's an important historical note, which a lot of people emphasize, and I want to give it some more air. Calvinism doesn't equal the five points or two of them. Um, not, not just that there can be disagreement on certain on some of the points there, but that even the framing of the five points are not necessarily reflective of the earliest points of the uh, Reformed tradition. So in light of that, if if by five point, if by Calvinist you mean five point tulipers, yeah, they exist in Anglicanism. There's plenty mm -hmm. of them there. Um, if by five point, if by a Calvinist, you mean more broadly reformed, though, not necessarily holding to every, uh, all of the five points. Right. Yeah. A lot of those as well. Um, pretty much from the beginning, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. E even among reformed Baptists, there's definitely a variety. Um, obviously there is debate like, oh, if you're, if you're, if you don't hold to limits atonement, you're a four point, you're not really a Calvinist. I, I would say, uh, you know. I would say, no, you're, you're reformed, you're a Calvinist, you're in. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree that even you might not even hold to every point, you can you can still uh, call yourself Calvinist. Um, but uh, but yeah, and, and my thing too, what, in my channel, and what I, I'm trying to emphasize uh, really is biblical unity and not uh, just any unity, right? Because like, uh, what I seen online before I started my channel was I seen a Trinitarian uh, unify with a non-Trinitarian, Unitarian, and stuff like that, and so I just see in so much of that, and just so, just so taken lightly of a central doctrine, the central truths uh, of, of of the of the faith, and so you know, yeah, that's one one of the reasons why I started this channel. Um, and like I said, like just inviting you on, showing people that even me as a Reformed Baptist, and obviously me uh, my history as a reformed baptist we, we come from basically the line of the church of england right in fact um that, that we kind of broke broke away from church of england uh, um i can speak for baptist uh, presbyterians they have their own story there <laughs> uh, obviously like th some some of us obviously would say we, we come more of the Purit puritan line of uh of, of the stream of our history but even them they still came from they, they they left away from the church of england um so we can all chase our roots back to uh anglicanism um, and so, but yeah, uh, let me see if I can get to, uh, I saw one question here in the comments. I don't know if you want to address this, uh, 
where um, Jonathan um, Sunbaker said, are the Anglican confessions sufficient for today's challenges, i.e. maintaining theological unity, ecclesiastical unity, orthodoxy? I mean, yeah. I mean, you can you can say that pretty much about any pretty pretty much any confession. Like, if people if everyone in ex communion just believed in the confessions, we'd have unity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the question is, though, how do you how do you bring about that unity? How do you enforce it? And in light of that, no single confession is going to be sufficient for that. Because what is a confession? A confession is basically a compilation of intellectual content about what we believe. Great. Does a document compel belief no not necessarily um you need people to do that you need rhetorical skill to do that you need ecclesial power to enforce that you need many different things to make it an actual reality so you can argue that your confessions are intellectually sufficient that's great and fine and i do believe that for the Anglican tradition mm. but you still need to do you still need to do things in order to make that a reality so in one sense yes in one says no mm. Okay. And we have the uh, other Luther. He commented on um, the TLM is just, is just fourth century equivalent to. Co and so, do you know that? Uh, I, I'm not. Common worship. Okay. Yeah. I, I, think, I think he's referring to the common worship, which was also more recently published by the Church of England, basically as a bunch of alternative worship forms, just with that, with that stupid mentality of, oh, well, it's okay. If you don't want to do the BCP, you can do all these different kinds of. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's yeah. a thing. He definitely said, uh, he said, uh, 1662 BCP contributed heavily to him escaping Rome. God bless Anglicans. Based, very based, mate. Amen, Indeed. brother. Amen. And so, is there anything you want to touch on, brother, before we uh, kind of end this live? I kind of didn't want to go too much because I, I didn't want to have um, this live uh, only an hour. And plus, I, I don't know how long you have, brother, but um, anything you wanted to touch on that maybe we didn't get to and anything that you wanted to bring up? Yeah, yeah. As, as a matter of fact, actually, thank you for reminding me with that. Yeah. Um, there is something I'd like to share, and it's something I actually uh, I made specifically for my interview, my recent interview um, on Redeem Zoomer's channel, mm. and so I put it in the uh, description of his, but I can share it here as well. Yep. Um, I'm just going to make sure there's nothing on the screen that's private or what have you. Uh, no, right. Oh, sorry, if I may share my screen, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Basically, it's basically a short Anglican 101 reading list. I made that for the uh, Redeem Zoom stream. So this is on my locals. Um, so, and, and on locals, people can join without becoming a supporter as well. Although if you did become a supporter, that'd be hugely appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a free post on my locals. So if you just become a member on there, you can see it. It's basically a 101 list of um, reading of like what historic classical Anglicanism believes. So you have listed here the formularies. Then you have a few works of general Anglican doctrine. All of these are from the 16th to early 17th century. So basically from the very beginning, the most authoritative in that respect. Um, you have a few works on theological authority, which is basically, which is a key area I like to study a lot. What are the authorities of our faith, um, among other things, as well as a, a, just a few other cool works of different kinds. So one of them, for example, being John Pearson's Exposition of the Creed, which is a massive commentary on the Apostles' Creed, a very cool work. So, uh, yeah, I commend this list to other people. And if people um, want other works on pretty much any other theological or ecclesiological issue you can think of um, on Anglicanism, you can either look them up yourself or you can even just message me, send me an email, what have you, and I can do that. Because uh, I and a few other uh, Sydney Anglican-based Sydney Anglican friends are actually currently working on what we're hoping to be a comprehensive um, list of 16th to probably around 17th or 18th century uh anglican works and we're finding a lot of very obscure ones to put there as well and once that's nearing some relative level of completion i intend to actually edit it into a into a source book to publish mm -hmm. um but yeah otherwise you have this list here and you can people can email me if they want other things so yeah that's that's what i wanted to add okay and I appreciate that. And um, like I said, guys, uh, the link in the description for his channel is below. Um, like I said, he has some great content there. Um, in fact, you interviewed uh, one of my heroes in the faith, James White. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and brother, uh, and so like, yeah, and that, that was recently too, right? Uh, that that interview? So. Not too long ago, yeah. It was a little bit, but not, not too long. Right. And so this, this can be my last question. What, what do you... What do you do? You have any appreciations of, of you know, like guys like James White or even just Reformed Baptists or Presbyterians? Uh, 
anything that you have that you, you like you you would think maybe even Anglicans could uh, learn from? I do. Um, I obviously disagree with a number of issues with Dr. Right. White, but nonetheless, I <laughs> um, nonetheless he was quite formative for me on um, discerning mm-hmm. reform theology. Mm-hmm. Um, not the be all end all, of course, but quite significant in that respect. Uh, his his his. I think he has a genuinely great sense of perspective on just how serious these issues are with Rome. I think, unfortunately, these days, a number of Protestants, quote unquote, get a bit too cozy and comfortable with Rome in the East in light of the recent um, return to like re- Protestant retrieval, which is a great thing. But I think uh, they uh, they often neglect just how serious the errors of Rome in the East are. Mm-hmm. And so I like Dr. White. He re-emphasizes that. He re-emphasizes the focus on scripture, even if I disagree with a number of his conclusions. Right. Um, and he's just a straight talker as well, which is uh, unfortunately a lot of that is missing today. So, mm. yeah. Okay. Well, all right, then that, that, that'll be it. Um, and like I said, I, Paul, the, uh, Paul, I appreciate you coming on and taking the time out. Like I said, like me and you've been texting back and forth trying to get a time frame. And, you know, like last week I was sick. And so like, I appreciate you taking the time out, brother. I really do. Man, I appreciate being on here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. All right, guys, uh, stay in tune for the next live. Uh, I'll probably be doing um uh, chapter two uh of ephesians uh my next live there um and uh yeah stay in tune guys and god bless i shall lose none that the father has given me and paul elaborates on that for the gospel is the power of god unto salvation it is the power of god the gospel is the good news so what i see in a reformed community online right now today are holding secondary issues as primary issues and, and it's like it's heartbreaking if anything a right understanding of God's sovereignty should be the most humbling of all the things. 